Jojo McNeil sat down in the Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, about six months after we graduated together from Williston Senior High School in 1959. Both of us were born in Wilmington. Several of us, including Jojo and me, entered high school at sophomores at the age of 13. One year before, newspapers had covered the murder of Emmett Till. At that time, things like uh, the Emmett Till murder dramatically uh, uh, it left a dramatic impression. I've heard it described as the fact that the civil rights movement after the Montgomery bus boycott was essentially dead. There was no national civil rights movement. So to speak, I mean, there were several national organizations. During our first semester, we learned how Rosa Parks sat down in the white section of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, beginning the bus boycott. In our junior year, the Little Rock Nine started integration within the Arkansas school system, which erupted in violence. We started to appreciate after Little Rock that Shepard was not equal. For example, here in Wilmington, uh, memory serves me right, there was one huge library that was available to whites where you could go and, and read magazines and uh, check out books and, and do other things you do in the library. And then there was a very small, almost two-room library that was available to black students, blacks in the community. Very limited in terms of uh, the books that it carried and the books that were available. So clearly, separate was not equal. Sitting down in, in Greensboro was the culmination of uh, a lot of separate events. And just come back from winter break, winter recess, and I was in New York. And so when I got on that bus, a strange process started developing. I didn't change, but suddenly people are viewing me very differently. It really bothered me. It made me very, very angry. In Richmond, uh, I went to the counter that was reserved for whites. And I was told that uh, you can't eat here. You have to go eat over there. So when I went back to AT, uh, I. Uh, told my three colleagues, we're part of the process. We're part of the problem. We're not doing anything to actively uh, take on the situation. Strangely enough, uh, when nationally all of us decided enough was enough, we decided that segregation should end. That's when it ended. In, in high school here in Wilmington, we talked about the need to be involved. We knew there would be detractors. No matter how we carried ourselves, there were going to be those who said uh, we were rabble out or whatever. Uh, so we thought that uh, it was important to uh, address the well and carry ourselves uh, in a respectable manner and uh, carry ourselves with dignity. We talked about sitting at lunch counters and things like that. I think we all, because of exposure to uh, the writing of Gandhi and, 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 uh, and Dr. King, understood the uh, importance of nonviolence. So we said about that to ask, create impressions where they needed, minds needed to be changed. We went over to people who uh, needed to change their, work, their way of thinking. And we chose a store like Woolworths because it was a national store. I suggest that they, they didn't serve us. Well, in fact, they had just served us. The only thing different is that we're not sitting down. First, the, uh, the kitchen help was directed to come over and tell us we're not going to get served. We should get on the leave, otherwise so the manager was going to come and get ourselves a lot of fun. And uh, we informed them that it was our intention to continue sitting in service. And 
So uh, then several white waitresses came over. And the rhetoric was the same. He was going to get in a lot of trouble. Uh, we're not going to serve you. And the store manager came over, Curly Harris. Well, he indicated that it was his intention to call the police. So shortly the after the policeman said, he starts to slowly walk back and forth in the aisle. Behind the lunch counter, behind us, thumping uh, his really little bent hand. So when we continued to sit, uh, I think it sort of startled him. While we were sitting, some strange things started to happen around the store, other than the policeman's present. An elderly white woman, probably, I would say, in her 70s. 80s, came to sit beside my associate Frank McCain and began a conversation with him. So that was like a shot of adrenaline. So we continued to sit, and I guess people started to mill around and crowd around us, observe what was going on, and we were able to back up. Kept insisting that we go back on the sure. uh, And so the manager closed the store to that. As we were leaving, we said, well, we'll see you tomorrow. And he had a sort of resigned look on his face and we left the store. As we emerged from the store at his entrance, um, a photographer from Associated Press, Jack Bowies, was there. Jack took her before us leaving. What, what was our intention to be back tomorrow? So I think that the next day, uh, in the afternoon, two or three o'clock, uh, we showed up again with uh, ten to twelve students, uh, and we continued to sit. The uh, third day, because of the exposure and then the local press and the Associated Press, people became aware. Uh, the third day, in addition to A&T students, three white coins, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, Women's College, joined uh, on that third day. I would imagine we had oh, 32 48 students. Other cities like High Point, uh, Western Salem, started to have synods. So these synods are, are starting all over the place. Uh, the folks in Nashville who had talked about this considerably prior to our action, we had no idea what they were planning or what they were doing. In Atlanta, they picked up on the idea that this became a student movement. The young students from all across our country who started to become involved and to do so in a nonviolent manner. They carried it so that we put insistence on our rights. We had sit in demonstrations in, in, in high word in this 54 cities in the South. And we started the uh, appreciate the fact that things would be picked up on the TV, in addition to the press and the magazine. Well, that summer, uh, lunch counters integrated in Greensboro in July, but obviously there were things to be done, uh, other things to be done, other areas of segregated life. What is perhaps unique in retrospect is the fact that all the thousands of people who participated in this. No one was saying, what's in this for me? It was a proud moment for America. Hopefully we all stand on each other's shoulders. Uh, had there not been people ahead of me who made sacrifices, uh, for example, Tuskegee Airmen actions made it possible for me to come on later on and be an Air Force officer. But the sacrifice of parents, 
all those teachers who were ahead of me made it possible for me to be who I was. And so, in the same sense, a lot of people made it possible for Obama to pursue the American dream. This interview was taken 50 years after JoJo and I graduated from Williston, almost to the day. It is to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the sit-in. When nationally all of us decided enough was enough, we decided segregation should end, that's when it ended.